Our scripture lesson today is printed in the bulletin. There are possibly as many different versions of our scripture lesson today as there are those of us who are present here. Uh, the, the version that is printed in the bulletin is from the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. I am actually going to share with you another version that I pray every night. It will be similar to this, but you will be able to see that the words are not exactly the same. You can follow along as I repeat my version. You are my shepherd, I shall not want. You make me to lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside still waters. You restore my soul. You lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in your house forever. May the Lord bless this reading of the scripture. Would you bow your heads? Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is the audience participation part of the sermon. But before I ask the question, I'm going to ask that two people who are present here this morning not participate in the audience participation part of the sermon. Zenobia and Suzanne will know to the answer to the question that I'm about to ask you. Uh, I don't know, we have someone over here who might know also, so I'm gonna ask you to dis disqualify yourself also. Uh, notice be below where the psalm is printed, the two words exegesis and Jesus. Anyone want to take a guess at the meaning of those words? Okay, Charles. Taking out of the scripture and what is read into the scripture. Okay, taking out of the scripture and what is read into the scripture. That's, uh, that could certainly be applied. Uh, it's not exactly a textbook definition, but it, it's a good way to describe what the words mean. Anyone else? taking out of the scripture and putting into the scripture. Kind of a textbook definition of the word exegesis is an explanation or interpretation of a text. It might be a biblical text, but it might be any kind of text. The word eisegesis means this. Exegesis means looking at the context of the scripture. When was it written? We believe that the 23rd Psalm was written about 1,000 years before the time of Christ. In what setting, what language, what culture, all of those things are part of an exegetical interpretation of the scripture. Eisegesis means something else. And I wanted to put this in here so you could see it printed instead of just saying it because I was afraid if I just said the words exegesis and eisegesis, you'd think I was saying extra Jesus and eisegesis as in, he thinks he's Jesus, eisegesis. He ain't Jesus, he's Kim. Eisegesis, as Charles has said, can mean, what does this text mean for me? Now, there can be a misuse of scripture. We can read a scripture and, for instance, some of the, the writings of Paul that would apply to a very specific time in a situation, specific situation, for instance, the church at Corinth. It is wrong to apply those things 
to a situation of First Christian Church Tulsa here today. There were times when Paul said, this is my opinion. Now, here I'm saying what God is saying, but this is just my opinion. So it's easy to misinterpret scripture, but a simple definition of eisegesis is, this is what this text means for me. This is what the text means in my life for how I live my faith. Today's sermon includes both exegesis and eisegesis of one of the most beloved, if not the most beloved passages of scripture in the Bible. The two most familiar passages of scripture in the Bible are probably the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer. How many of you have been to a funeral when you heard the 23rd Psalm read? That's what is always read nearly, isn't it? And just as we did this morning, we pray the Lord's Prayer. For Christians, John 3.16 would be listed among the most popular scriptures. But the thing about the 23rd Psalm that is different is this. It is a scripture that is beloved by other faiths besides Christianity. The religion of Judaism would list the 23rd Psalm as one of its most beloved passages. It is easy to understand why. The Lord is my shepherd. We remember the words from the 10th chapter of John when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. So we read that into the meaning of the 23rd Psalm. Jesus did that. That was Isa Jesus. The psalmist had no idea who Jesus of Nazareth was. But Jesus, a good Jew, knew the 23rd Psalm and said, I am the good shepherd. He leads me beside still waters. Has there ever been a time when we have been more in need of being led to still waters? This is a psalm of providence. He provides for us. He guides us. He leads us. Perhaps the most popular phrase of the 23rd Psalm, through the valley of the shadow of death. That's why it's read so often at funerals. Goodness and mercy shall follow me. The word that could be used here is goodness and mercy shall pursue me. The Hebrew word is the word hesed, a word that means the mercy of God, the loving kindness of God. And then the phrase, I shall dwell in God's house forever. There is one phrase, however, that I would suggest most of us have not considered very seriously. The Lord prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Have you ever thought about what that means? Probably the literal meaning is this. The word enemy or enemies is mentioned 80 times in the Psalms. There was a literal understanding of enemies. And the psalmist is saying, even when my enemies are all around me, God still provides. But is perhaps there another meaning? When I started several years ago to consider the meaning of this phrase, one thing that came to mind was this, true story. A church was having a church fight. It wasn't over any kind of theological issue or who should be accepted or not accepted or forgiven or not forgiven. The church fight was about whether the church should provide a parsonage or parsonage allowance for the minister. When we do that kind of thing, I don't know if God laughs or cries. 
But this is how bad it got. In a Christian church, as much as communion means to us, one woman, the matriarch of the church, loved everyone in the church. Everyone loved her. One Sunday, when the deacon who brought her the tray with communion started to hand her the tray, she looked up at him and said, I will not take that tray from you because they were on opposite sides of an argument about whether the church should provide a parsonage or a parsonage allowance. First lesson from the story. Any time you read any scripture in the Bible that mentions the word table, you need to listen closely. Especially in our tradition, in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, it's not a coincidence that this table is at the center of our sanctuary. You have been in other churches and noticed that often it's the pulpit that is, that, that is at the center of the sanctuary. In the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, the table is at the center of the sanctuary because we believe that the table is the most important thing that we do in our worship service. More important than the hymns that we sing, more important than the sermon, more important than the fellowship time, the heart of our worship service, the center of our worship service is this table. And what do we say at the table? All are welcome. This isn't our table, it's the Lord's table. It is the Lord who invites, and all are welcome. Good news. What we receive at this table enables us to live in a way that we never would otherwise. This is a discouraging time. If you're not discouraged, by the events of the past few months, I don't know if you've been paying attention. It is a discouraging time. It is easy to become overcome with despair, but this table, what we receive at this table, enables us to live as persons of faith, enables us to live with hope. This table gives us wisdom. I want to ask you to do something now. There are only two people present in the sanctuary now who understand what it is. I'm sorry, three. Three persons present in the sanctuary now who understand what it means to face racism. Imagine this, if you will. Imagine sending your teenage son or grandson out, say, to go to the grocery store to buy some groceries. And you don't know if you will ever see them alive again. But in Tulsa, we've seen the other side of this also, haven't we? Imagine what it would be like to have your husband or your wife or your father or your mother or your brother or your sister or your son or your daughter go to work. And when they left, you don't know if you'll ever see them alive again. We understand that in Tulsa, don't we? Remember the names Craig Johnson and Aris Zarkashan, the two police officers who in Tulsa were shot, one killed. We receive wisdom from this table that enables us to see both sides of these difficult issues. The table says who isn't, who is not, our enemy. Sadly, in our nation, we have two political parties 
who treat each other as enemies. They aren't enemies. They're on the same side. They're all Americans. Sadly, in our nation, we have some churches that see other churches as an enemy. We're not enemies. We're on the same side. And certainly in our nation, even more so in the past few months, we have persons who see persons of other races as their enemy. The question is not who is our enemy. The question is what is our enemy. When God created the world, we read in scripture that God said, this is good. This is very good. But when we see the ugliness that we have seen in the past few months, we know this is an enemy, not only our enemy, but an enemy of God. Ugliness, ugliness. There is a wonderful old hymn that says, God who touches earth with beauty, make me lovely too. With thy spirit, recreate me pure and strong and true. It is not who is our enemy, but what is our enemy. Sadly, almost as controversial as wearing a face mask in our nation, it has been controversial, has become controversial, to mention the words, Black Lives Matter. That just sets some people off when they hear those words. In this church, we know Black Lives Matter, don't we? If you were a member of this church a few years ago, you can remember when Beverly used to do the children's sermon and there would be 40 or 50 children up here on the steps of all races. Do you remember the time when Jeremy asked the kids in the youth group to draw a picture of Jesus and one girl drew, drew a rainbow? She said, that's what Jesus looks like, all colors. We know Black Lives Matter. When I first heard that saying, I thought, well, that's not right. All lives matter. But you see, that's similar to saying all men are created equal. We know that's not true, don't we? We know when those words were written, there were slaves in our country. We know when those words were written, women couldn't vote. But we know Black Lives Matter because when those little children were on the steps, sometimes we would sing, Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. In preparation for this sermon, I learned there is another verse to the hymn. Jesus died for all the children, all the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus died for all the children of the world. But there is another verse. Jesus rose for all the children all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus rose for all the children of the world. Amen. Amen. <laughs>